The construction of Europe is an art. It is the art of the possible. Such were the words of Jacques Chirac, former president of France, during his term at the turn of the 21st century. Probably he wasn't the first to make such a claim, as ever since the earliest kings and emperors began to build their nations on the continent, many have sought to do just that. From the vast roads and territorial holdings of the Roman Empire, to the kingdom of Charlemagne and the Byzantine Empire, all the way through to the conquests of Napoleon, Hitler, and Stalin, countless figures throughout time have attempted to shape the continent into what they believe to be possible. In today's world, we're lucky enough to have relatively few madmen dictators eyeing Europe for continental domination, Instead, Europe's ongoing endeavors into the art of the possible have come via the European Union, that supranational collection of states that stretches from the Mediterranean to the Arctic Circle. With 27 member states, 10 official and unofficial candidates for new membership, and substantial diplomatic ties with the non-participatory nations of Europe, the EU is a political entity all its own. In its own right, it's an emerging global superpower, and one that charts a course that's never been seen before on the continent. But uniting most of Europe under one political confederation is only half of the job. Although most European citizens can, at this point, navigate well over half of the continent without needing their passport, getting from place to place is another animal entirely, as the infrastructure of most European nations has never been truly integrated to a continental system. The subject of today's video, the 10T Network, was designed to change all of that, and when it's finally completed, it will bring the European continent together in a way that has never been done before. In the early 1990s, the European Union was composed of just 12 participatory nations. Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Denmark, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. Eager to expand the Union's shared economy and equally interested in growing their influence and potential across the globe, the member states began to discuss the feasibility of a single infrastructure policy that would guide their future development. In 1996, shortly after Austria, Finland, and Sweden joined the Union, the European Council and the European Parliament jointly approved the policy's first iteration. This so-called Master Plan outlined the major road, rail, and waterway networks that would be integrated across Europe. The Master Plan was a direct response to many of the problems that faced Europe at the time. Although the European Union's member states were doing their best to work together, most of their national infrastructure was just that, national. After all, old generations of infrastructure planners in each country had been trying to connect their own cities and major industrial centers, and most of the time international crossings had been an afterthought when they were even built at all. Good luck finding a direct route from, say, Madrid to Berlin. You could either work through knot after knot of freeways and back roads, or we suppose you could off-road for a couple of thousand kilometers. This then caused a bottleneck at the major border crossings that did exist, as increased trade led to increased traffic and transport. The problem was similar, but much worse for rail networks, where tracks of different gauges would make border crossings impossible. Sea-based shipping had many of the same issues. In 1999, the master plan was upgraded into the Trans-European Transport Network, the 10T. Its stated goals were intentionally broadened. 10T would develop a Europe-wide network to include every mode of transportation and ensure that every country had the infrastructure and service capacity that they needed to make the infrastructure run. The plan maintained a firm focus on long-lasting, high-quality, sustainable infrastructure. No corner of the European Union was to be left out. The entire system was to be interoperable, and it would integrate, wherever possible, to existing national infrastructure instead of rendering it obsolete. After years and years more of careful planning and diplomacy, 2013's revision of the 10T policy is the one that has endured till today. Unlike prior iterations, the modern policy includes two distinct layers, the core network and the comprehensive network. The core network is precisely what it sounds like, and it focuses on the projects that would form the backbone of the 10T system across Europe. This includes bottlenecks, border crossings, crucial gaps in the current transport infrastructure, and multimodal hubs where air, sea, rail, and road infrastructure can all converge. And not just that, but the core network's emphasis on cities, major ports, and airports, and railway terminals ensures that it would have a profound impact on the lives of EU citizens. The core 
network encompasses a truly vast number of individual projects across Europe in some of the busiest and most socio-economically vibrant cities in the world. And the target of data completion 2030, which is now just a few short years away. And as massive as the core network's impact would be, it's only a fraction of what is intended for the comprehensive network. A behemoth sprawled across every corner of the European Union, the comprehensive network is targeted for completion by 2050. And for good reason. This half of the TENT endeavor is meant to reach into Europe small towns and villages, cross mountain ranges and impassable oceans, and link together every outpost, island, and exclave with the broader European Union as a whole. Not only that, but the comprehensive network plan calls for overhaul and repair of the many failing or unsafe portions of Europe's existing infrastructure. There's also plans for disaster resiliency and special measures to make sure that the system is accessible to all its users. It is a gargantuan project, on a scale rarely conceived and hardly ever attempted in human history. Construction has been underway on the TNT network for years, and in order to understand how a project of this magnitude has any hope of success, it's important to take a close look at where and how that construction is taking place. The core network, again, the portion of the TNT network focused on the most critical infrastructure, is arranged into nine key corridors, all connecting major cities by road and rail. For example, the North Sea Baltic Corridor runs from Finland through the Baltics, then to Poland, Germany, the Netherlands, and to its final terminus in Belgium, 3,200 kilometers away. Initially, this corridor was supposed to connect to the UK, but, you know, Brexit happens. The Mediterranean corridor runs for 3,000 kilometers from the Strait of Gibraltar in Spain to almost the Hungarian border with Ukraine, and the Scandinavian Mediterranean corridor runs north to south from Finland and Sweden through Germany and Italy to its terminus in Malta, nearly 5,000 kilometers away. Each of the core network corridors works in the same way. Every member nation of the European Union touches at least one, and along each corridor lies many more individual projects. Now, any long-time viewers of this channel know that we're going to have to talk about the sticky bit sooner or later, the incredible price. The European Union's January 2014 budget set aside about $20 billion to finance the project through 2020, slated for use in a total of 94 major ports and freight hubs, 38 large airports with rail connections, 35 individual projects to enhance and improve border crossings, and an overhaul of a full 15,000 kilometers of rail, which would be able to serve high-speed traffic traffic. Also, out of that budget comes the money to support continent-wide initiatives for air traffic management, rail traffic management, and intelligent transport systems. But that $20 billion is just what the European itself has been able to provide, and individual nations have also put aside considerable sums for the projects that impact their own infrastructure. With such a massive amount of spending, it's reasonable to assume that Europe's nations see real benefit to ensuring that the 10T network is constructed. In fact, the network is projected to add a staggering 10 million jobs across Europe, as well as increase Europe's GDP by nearly 2% by 2030, in addition to the myriad of other revenues and savings that an interconnected and a refurbished European infrastructure will create. And it's not just nations that are contributing either. Over the 2010s, a number of private corporations invested their own money in the 10 network and yet another sign of confidence around its ultimate goals. Of course, the other thing that long-time viewers are waiting for is for us to talk about the setbacks that 10 has faced on its way to completion. And there have been more than a few, and we are going to get there, but we've also got quite a bit of good news about the network. Several major projects are already completed. The overhaul and integration of Milan's Malpensa Airport, a massive cable-stayed bridge that brings rail and road connection across the Arson Strait between Denmark and Sweden, and two major railways, one connecting Dublin, Belfast, and Cork on Ireland, and one connecting the city of Rotterdam to the German border. In Southeast Europe, the road infrastructure of the 10 network likewise has been completed, bridging gaps with non-EU states in the Balkans like Serbia, Kosovo, and Albania. 
Other major projects are also nearing completion, including a railway line that travels from Berlin, crosses the Alps, and goes all the way down to Sicily. Also bordering completion are the so-called motorways of the sea, which comprise a network of logistically integrated shipping lanes on every sea that Europe touches. Countless projects are well on their way to being done, and the Galileo system, a network of 30 satellites providing incredibly accurate GPS data to the entire continent, has more than two-thirds of its satellites operational as we speak. Sadly, though, it's not likely we'll see the entire core network operational by 2030 as originally planned. Like any mega project that has been under construction in the year 2020, most parts of the network have been negatively impacted by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, slowing work or stopping it altogether. But even before global lockdowns, many of the 10 ts projects were already behind schedule. One audit of eight cross-border 10 t initiatives found that of the eight, six were behind schedule, and on average, they were behind schedule by 11 years. These delays just on these six projects comprised over half of the core network's timetable because of how tightly every project is interrelated. Poor international coordination, slow disbursement of funds, and a lack of compliance with 10 t regulations were all to blame. And mind you, this is still before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. The European Union, for their part, are attempting to fix the issue. In December 2021, the European Commission overhauled their approach to the 10 t network, leaving the idea of the nine core network corridors behind, but leaving the plans for each one very much intact. In its place, the EU has merged the core network corridors with its planned rail freight corridors, a separate and equally expansive initiative to connect the EU's major freight terminals. By combining both aspects of the network and taking a holistic view of the entire endeavor, the European Commission hopes that this change will make investment and international coordination far easier. The change also integrates many parts of the comprehensive network that has been delayed until 2050, moving up their timetables dramatically. This incentivizes each nation to work harder and quicker to make their own sparse, mountainous, or peripheral regions accessible, with the expectation that this will help national legislatures justify spending on the project as a whole. Between new financing options, a smoothing over of diplomatic sticking points, and a boost to overall project efficiency, there's reason to be very cautiously optimistic that developments could start to move along more quickly. It's a grim reality in today's world that the European continental order has been fundamentally changed by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The world has responded with a heavy combination of horror, shock, and sanctions, and the 10 t network has been no different. In recent months, Russia and Belarus were removed from any and all plans around the 10 t network, as the European Commission now considers expansion to those countries both ill-advised and undesirable. Planned border crossings into Russia and Belarus have been sharply downgraded in priority, and work is ongoing to rewrite plans for the nations bordering Russia, while still ensuring that border-facing regions of EU nations still get their share of network service. But as the EU takes its distance from Russia, it has also worked to integrate Ukraine into the long-term vision for the project. Four of the 10 T's major corridors are likely to be expanded to reach Ukraine and Moldova, including major cities like Kiev, Mariupol, Odessa, and Chisinau. There are a number of challenges with integrating these two countries, particularly because Ukrainian railways operate on a different gauge than the standard gauge of the EU. But the grain crisis of the last several months strongly underscores just how important it's going to be to figure out a system of integration. Of the components of the 10 network that still need work, digitization is perhaps the one that will most dominate the work ahead. 10 is just as much about intelligent transport systems and information technology as it is about roads and railways. But where individual countries do have quality digital services in place, they are often incompatible with each other and poorly integrated with real-world infrastructure. And that's before we even talk about the parts of the network that are still operating on analog. Fixing this issue involves a two-step process. Implementing and homogenizing digitized infrastructure services across a certain nation and integrating each nation's digital network to the overall 10 t system. This can be done, and the areas that need the most digital infrastructure are often the ones that have finished many of their physical infrastructure projects. But as of today, this phase of the project is just in its early stages. Also on the EU's mind, as the 10 t projects continue forward, is sustainability. The European Green Deal, launched over the last few years, calls for a drawdown in greenhouse gas emissions by 90% in the transport sector by 2050. 
With this in mind, 10 deregulations and policies are being revised to raise standards, plan ahead for the use of alternative fuels and electric vehicles, and ensure that the network's 424 major cities are all equipped with their own plans to overhaul local sustainability. In many ways, the Green Deal's requirements only complicate the challenge ahead. But they also represent a trade-off that promises greater benefit in the long term in exchange for some short-term complications. And finally, as the TENT network stretches outward and encompasses more and more arrivals to the European Union, it will eventually come up on an outward border. What will lay beyond that border, for now, depends to be seen. But one reasonable guess on what may be there is the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, we've done a mega projects video already on the Belton Road, but to summarize, it's an infrastructure project that is similar in many ways to the TenT network. Proposed by China and Xi Jinping, it aims to connect South and Central Asia, the Middle East, and East Asia together under one vast economic belt. Although its borders are loosely defined and much of its scope differs from the TenT, it stands to reason that its westward boundaries of road and rail might one day brush up against the EU's eastward ones. This could result in any number of outcomes, which will probably depend on the geopolitics of the day. After all, if the rising superpowers of China and the EU end up feeling particularly bitter toward one another by that time, two vast highway systems, not even touching each other, would be appropriately petty. But say that things go the opposite way, that the intersection of the TenT and the Belt and Road provides a modern-day continuous route from the shores of the Atlantic to the shores of the Pacific. Millions and millions of tons of freight travel between Europe and Asia every year, either taking weeks to arrive by sea or spewing a truly ridiculous amount of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere or when they go by air. If all those goods could travel along a safe, dependable, internationally standard railway, there's no telling what the benefits could be, both to the climate and the global economy. And although the benefits for passengers would obviously be a bit lesser, there's something to be said for a world where you can get into a car in Madrid and take the freeway all the way to Shanghai. In many respects, the sheer scale and scope of the TenT network was such that it seems almost impossible to fathom it ever being completed. But despite delays, shifting priorities, and confounding factors of war and a global pandemic, the European Union's grand plan is beginning to come together. In terms of ambition, yes, you would be within your rights to say that the whole scheme is crazy. But as it turns out, it's so crazy that it just might work. And if it does, if the TenT network is completed, the benefits are staggering to behold. Competition would mean a massive boost to the European economy, and with it, all the regional and national economies in Europe. It would mean a drastic reduction in greenhouse gases, a massive improvement in sustainable, disaster-proof infrastructure, and a far more accessible, interconnected continent. And perhaps best of all, even if work on the entire TenT network were to stop tomorrow, it's not like any of the mega-projects that one day lose their funding and are condemned to collect dust on a shelf for all eternity. And perhaps best of all, even if work on the entire TenT network were to stop tomorrow, it's not like any of the projects are just going to sit on a shelf collecting dust. The TenT network isn't really so much a mega-project as it is a giga-project. It's made up of a thousand mega projects to benefit the people of Europe. An integrated port and rail system here, an international freeway artery there. Every single initiative is worth doing, and every single one that will be completed in the future really matters to the peoples and nations it will impact. The TenT network is not those individual mega projects, it's the thing that unifies them all and stands a chance at making Europe greater than the sum of its parts.